really just really super smooth. Really smooth. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that's the appropriate. <laughs> anyway, that's my book. Welcome to this house of books, everybody. We're really pleased to see you here. We have a special author tonight. We have Elise Morello, one of our very favorite authors. And we have a very special person to introduce her. It's her award-winning author husband, Craig Lancaster. Hi. Bob? Tell him I'll call let's, him back. Let's shut that down, Bob. <laughs> tell, tell him I'll call him back. Um, so this is Elisa Lorel. Um, this is this is my wife. This is my best friend. This is uh, someone I'm enormously proud of because um, we have a new book out, um, and she is uh, she is feeling like she's at the top of her game, which is a really cool way to enjoy the Elisa Lorello experience. Um, so, uh, so we'll just get right into it. So, uh, how's it going? It's going good. Yeah, yeah. How you been? I'm, I'm yeah. just doing good. Yeah. Family Thanks. doing okay? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Nieces, nieces and nephews growing up. Nieces yeah. and nephews are good. The cat's yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's 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 good to see you again. Yeah, yeah. it's great. To see you. <laughs> okay. So, can I borrow your book real quick? Yeah. All right, because this is where I want to start. I got several questions, and I hope you're ready for them. And it doesn't matter if you're not, because I'm ready for them. So, <laughs> so. I just want to read folks the dedication page. Um, the dedication page goes like this. First thing is a quotation. What I want to know is why there aren't more female producers. John Taylor, the bassist of Duran Duran. And then the second quotation is, it all comes down to what happens between the notes. And that quotation is from Mike Lorello, musician, producer, engineer, and the best big brother anyone could want. This book is for them. So what's going on there? Okay. <laughs> so those two quotes are basically what inspired the book. Um, the first one by John Taylor, as you all know exhaustively by now, I am a <laughs> lifelong Duran Duran fan. Um, and so I was listening to an interview with him, and I don't remember the rest of the context of the conversation, but he said that. And the moment he said it, it was that, that wonderful lightning that strikes with authors happened to me of, um, I'm gonna answer that question in a novel. And all I knew is that's, what I'm, that's who I'm going to write about. I'm going to write about that female record producer. Can I inter interrupt you? Yes, um, you So what people also need to know is that um, Elisa has pretty much been in love with John Taylor <laughs> since she was 13 years yes. old, which I'm totally okay with because um, because if, if you were ever to ensnare him, <laughs> y'all could go on double dates with me and Julianne Moore. So <laughs> I think it would just work ideally. So, all right. So anyway, now the Mike Lorello. In. So then, now yeah. my follow up on that. Um, so the other inspiration was that I grew up in a musical family, and um, uh, around the time of my teenage years, my brothers actually converted part of the basement into a recording studio. So I pretty much lived above a recording studio, and. Um, it's a happy place for me. I don't even, I'm not a musician myself. I, I don't have that, those particular gifts, although I've dabbled around with guitar and singing and things like that, but I just don't have what they have. But I can sit in a studio and I can watch them work and I am in heaven. Um, and so that informed a lot of this book as well. And so one of the things I did when I started writing the book was I, I called my brother and I said, I want to interview you and kind of shadow you, not as your sister. I really want to try to be as objective as possible and do it from the point of view of just an author who's watching you work. 
And that, that was <coughs> actually a really great experience for the both of us because, and I let him know, I'm gonna ask you questions that sister already knows, but I'm gonna ask them as if I don't know what you do, you know? And so it was really great. It was a great experience. We learned a lot about each other's creative processes, things that I don't think even at the time I, you know, again, I've watched him work all my life, all my life, but I just finally saw it in a different way. And so that really informed a lot of the character, Joey. Um, we, we should, and we should point out that um, Mike Lorello isn't um, just like a guy with downloaded software in his garage. He's, yeah. He's, he's the real deal. He is, yeah. he has uh, written songs for huge names. He has played on the albums of huge names. He is sought after for his wizard wizardry in the yeah. in the studio. So so you were watching you were watching a real pro. Oh absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. and and I've even worked with him in terms of he I've um, sung and he's recorded me and he just makes me sound <laughs> really good. <laughs> I seem to recall That's how good he is. <laughs> I seem to recall a certain Christmas yes. gift. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um so, um, so the next thing I want to do, because I don't want to rob the experience from anyone else who will read the book, is I would like to tell you what I think the book is about, and in broad strokes, and then you can tell me. Um, and I know you don't have a lot of experience at this, but then you can you can tell me all the ways in which I'm wrong. Okay, um, so. Um, I'm thinking, so the book, the book concerns, the, the primary character is a former teenage female pop star. From, and from the 80s. From the 80s, right. So our, we, we would have been listening to her when yes. we were in high school. We would have heard her stuff. And she is now a music producer because the window closes on being a teenage female pop star. Um, but she was she was less like a manufactured act and more real musician. She wrote her own stuff, she played her own stuff, um, and uh, she had to she had to fight the system for what her identity was, right? So so I think that's that's part of it, but it is a friendship. The, the yeah. one thing that is manufactured is her name. Right. So so her her full name is is Johanna, which by the way was my maternal my excuse me my paternal grandmother's name. Um, so her her real name is Johanna. The uh, you're figuring around that time that was probably what she was called. Actually, I actually there is a deleted chapter where I actually went into the origin of her name and. Her parents, originally I had it that her parents called her Hannah. So by the time she she um, signs her contract, they, they were saying Hannah is not a pop star name. Um, it's and, really not. And so, yeah. um, so they wanted, so the record company wanted to change her name to Paisley because she had this signature Paisley scarf. Yeah. And so that, so, so as her teen persona is Paisley Parker. And um, which Joey, is, which is a pop star name, and yeah. she, she she eventually uses Joey. And again, this none of this backstory actually made it into the book. This is things I, I wound up taking out. But she eventually goes with Joey for two reasons. One is that, and we're going to talk about the next yes. thing, so I'm going to segue into it. But one thing is um, her beloved uncle called her that would call her Joey. And then the other thing was because she was kind of going into out of the spotlight and into the studio she wanted a more masculine name so she figured until they see her face to face they're going to assume joey parker is a guy and that they're going to want to work with the male producer right so which which does lead into the next yeah. thing so i would encourage everyone to read the review of the book at the this house of books mm -hmm. uh website mm -hmm. uh is written by our own julie schultz um, and uh, I, I think I think that um, I mean I know I as an author am just hoping 
somebody gets what I was trying to do. And I think this review really gets what yes. you were trying to do. Yes. And this is, this is the part of that review I would like to read, because uh, I think there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. The best part of this book, though, is the author's deft inclusion of how age and gender affect the way we choose to live. Publishers often struggle to categorize Lorello's work since her stories focus on human relationships in all their guises, not just the romantic sort. Since this is what most of the books in a typical high school English curriculum do, it is hard not to wonder whether Lorello's novels would be considered just fiction if they were written under a man's name. Um, that really resonated with me because I know it's a lot harder for you than it is for me. Yeah. And it's not that easy for me. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so I was curious as to whether you could talk about that a little bit. Yes, and this is actually what I was trying to angle into when I asked you that question at the High Plains Book Awards panel discussion. Okay, all right. Um, and this is a conversation that Julie and I have had. <laughs> so most of the time, my books are marketed as, when, not even most of the time, all the time, my books are marketed as women's fiction. And I, I can't even say it's love, hate, but it's... It's an uneasy alliance. If you wanna, yeah. if you wanna say a relationship is complicated, that's yeah. the relationship that's complicated. Because I, I think the other women who write in that genre are just fabulous writers and, and there, there are some wonderful books in the genre. The problem I have with the genre is that term because it excludes an entire audience. Um, Craig would not have picked up my books had he not been friends with me. Oh, that's, um, that's precisely right. And, I mean, and so, yeah. and other, you know, other, um, again, mostly men would not pick up my books. And even some women would not pick up my books because they are automatically guessing it is, it is of a certain nature. And, and more often than not, it's, you know, I, I feel like it's it more belongs in contemporary fiction. And that is too broad, I think, for most publishers to say that's that's where it goes. So they automatically say, we can sell this a lot easier if we call it women's fiction. But again, I think it just, ex it's so, it just excludes so many people. And, it, and, and that happens with packaging and with marketing and well, I told, I told you, you know, when I read your books initially, and we were just friends, mm -hmm. we were just two people who had the same publisher. And I said, there's no way I would have picked up any of these books because, um, because they are designed in a certain way. And I mean, my, my, my joke is that, you know, there's not enough, her book covers don't have enough guys, you know, smashing beer cans on their foreheads, you know? Uh, but that's not even, that's not even really it. Another it's, guy once told me, are there car chases in it? Yeah, 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 does shit get blown up? Um, yeah. So, um, but then I, so then I read it because you were my friend and I realized that, you know, you have, you have these stories, every single one of them. And I know just like anybody else, there are ones that you feel like you executed better than you did than others, but every single one of them is this heart thumping, blood pumping, you know, fast moving story. But there is a real layer of depth under all of it, and I think that's where this whole women's fiction thing really gets undersold. I I do know where they're coming from. I just did an event in Big Sky, and there were 13 people in the room, and I was the only man. Um, and that happens a lot. So, you know, well, women and, are largely and, buying the books and reading the books. Right. And, but I think it gives women not all that much credit, you know, and to say. And your genre just, is not men's fiction. No, your no, it's everybody's is, fiction. Your genre is fiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's the disadvantage. Yes. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, and it's really, and, it, and that, that really only goes one way, that, that who gets shaded out. It really only goes one way. And I yeah. did, I did 
bristle against it for a couple of years where I, I just refused to say that, you know, somebody said, well, what are your books are about? Or where, you know, where can I find your books? And I would say, and I still say, well, they're marketed as women's fiction. So okay. I still kind of start with that. Mm -hmm. Or they're marketed as romantic comedy. And some of them are definitely straight up rom-coms and I'm fine with that because I chose that. Um, but um, for a while, I, I definitely bristled against it and I was kind of trying to make my own, make up my own genre, which I called <laughs> romance rhetoric, which actually was, a, which, which a, a, an actual rhetorical scholar actually came up with that. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to use that. But then you realize there's no, there's never going to be a shelf in this house of books <laughs> called romance rhetoric. Right. And so I, I pulled, you know, I, I kind of stopped you know, kicking and screaming and, and stamping my feet and said, all right, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to go where, where the market is telling me to go, but I also really want to try to reach as many people as possible with what I write. I, I, I've always thought we should take the fight to, and, and no offense to Julie and Mark and everybody else at this House of Books, which is the greatest bookstore. Um, <laughs> You know, I've always thought we should take the fight to the bookstores and go, how about two sections? This is the, the Michael Shabon idea. Two, two sections in the bookstore, good books and bad books, and we won't stock any of the bad books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, now clearly somebody has to be the gatekeeper of that idea, but... Um, well, and Craig Johnson kind of said that too. In my, there's good and again, writing I, and bad I pushed writing. back on that yeah. because who... Who decides? They, you know, one person is going to lose sleep reading this because they're going to stay up all night. The other person, this is going to be their sleeping pill. <laughs> you know, they're they're going to read it, and after three pages, so who who can who has the right to even say that? Right. That this these are the good books and these are the bad books. So. I, I, even then, I bristle against. Yeah, but, yeah. But, well, we just put that power in, you know, Julie and Mark and Gus's hands. But, but and... One, one thing I also want to say, though, about that, what you read from that review is, I don't know that I necessarily set out to write that. Yeah. <laughs> I think as Joey's story came out, I, I, I knew she, I mean, the fact that her name is Joey, you know she's she's struggling a little bit in in this world um, with with some kind of gender identity because first she was exploited as a teen pop star and then she's she's choosing to kind of make herself invisible and then she's working very much predominantly in a man's world um, and so she's she does struggle with this um, but even some things that I was writing came out very subconsciously. I, Craig, I mean, Craig even said, this sounds like your author career to me. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and I don't think I was deliberately doing that. I think all of that just came out as these things come out. Right, you know, I thought- It wasn't intentional. I yeah. thought you were struggling for a while to rediscover the joy. Yes, absolutely, And, and yeah. when the book opens, uh, Joey, is not a joyful person. She's not. Yeah, she's, and, she's burnt out. Yeah, so um, I'm glad you brought up, you know, the the challenges for her in the work because I think the excerpt you're going to read really gets at that. Yes. So let's take a few minutes and sure. share a little bit with with everybody. We're going to start with a little water. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Okay, so I will set the scene a little bit for you. So um, Joey has a, uh, much like my brother does now, she has a professional recording studio in her house and in her basement. Um, and so um, this uh, band that she has loved her, loved her whole, or started to, you know, loved in adolescence until she became their peer. Um, uh, just so happens to be a British quintet, yeah. um, and and um, so th so they have asked her to produce this 
album for her. So they're they're kind of they they haven't had as great a career as the other band that I that I love. Um, so they so they're trying to kind of make one more comeback, and so they've asked her to produce the album. So they they started in her studio, but because word got out that that they're there and, and her studio is easy to locate. There were fans showing up at the door and stuff. So they decide to move to East Hampton um, where the bass player lives. Um, this takes place on Long Island, by the way. Um, and so they, they, the bass player lives there and they convert kind of his living room into a recording studio. Um, so they have moved the sessions there so they can resume their, their productivity. Um, so I'll, I'll just introduce a couple of characters that are going to be referenced. Oh, first of all, I am not doing English, British accents. Uh, I don't have that range. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> who's that girl? Uh, yeah, who's that um, girl right there? Um, <laughs> so, um, you should, you should say something about Joey and Garrett. Okay, yeah. so so the ba the bassist is Garrett Chandler, and they've got a lot of history together. In that she was in love with his now late twin brother Gavin, where they were Gavin and she were both in love. That's all I'm going to say about that. Right. Um, so the the previous album. Um, and this band is called Taro, by the way. And, the, and the, the previous album was called Been Too Long, and that's the one that just completely flopped. Um, and so this is why they're asking her to work with them. Um, uh, a couple of characters that you're just going to hear the name. One is Rick, who is um, a fellow engineer um, and a good friend of hers. Um, you're going to hear two names, John and Edgar, and these were Taro's producer and engineer back in the 80s, and Joey kind of revered them and wanted to be like them, so most of her style as a producer and an engineer is based on those two guys, so you hear a reference to them. Um, and I think, and there's cursing that's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, there is. <laughs> You, so. you can bleep that out if yeah. you want in the recording. <laughs> um, so I think I covered all of that. Can you see anything there? That nope, I didn't? you're good. Okay. So, and one more thing I'll say is they're well into the recording process now. Okay, and things are just getting a little tense. One of the reasons making Been Too Long had been such a nightmare, Michael had confided in me, was that Garrett no longer had his ally, his partner in crime. John and Edgar had known how to handle them. John especially had parented them, gave them each a credible voice and validated their opinions and talents. But he also put his foot down with them, told them to sit down and shut up when they started throwing tantrums even overrode them on some decisions. He'd needed to be a parent. They'd all been so young and some of them hadn't gotten much parenting or discipline at home. But here they were now, still acting like a bunch of children. The latest blow up was over a simple guitar chord that Garrett wanted in the bridge of one of Johnny's songs. It's a diminished seventh, you wanker, Garrett yelled at Johnny at full volume. Learn your bloody scales. I know the bloody scale and I know the bloody chord, Johnny hollered back, but it's a pop record, not a jazz solo. <laughs> right, God forbid we make a pop record that's, you know, good for a change, said Garrett. The C minor is fine, Garrett, said Michael said. Spoken like a true Julie, said Garrett, his derogatory term for musicians who were classically trained at the famous Juilliard School of Music. Michael wasn't one of them, but he might as well have been. God forbid we stray from the technically correct into something exciting. It is not fine, he thundered. It's bloody boring. Oh, for fuck's sake, I said, exasperated. Johnny forcefully removed his guitar strap from his shoulder and set the instrument in its holder. <laughs> Are you leaving, said Garrett, baiting him. I'm going to throw you through that bloody glass if you don't knock it off, Johnny yelled, pointing at the picture window. I stood up. Enough! 
I turned to Johnny. You, go cool off. Jump in the pool or the ocean or something. Watch out for jellyfish. I turned to Garrett next. You, into the kitchen with me. Then to Ian and Michael. You, don't say or do anything to piss me off in the next 30 seconds. Finally, to Rick, I said in as calm of, a, a voice as possible, can you find me some Advil, please? <laughs> sure, he said before he muttered under his breath loud enough for only me to hear, can you find me a flamethrower? <laughs> Bless Rick. He stood and set off in search of a medicine cabinet. I pushed Garrett into the direction of the kitchen. Once there, he leaned against the island. I retrieved a tumbler from one of the cabinets, filled it to the top with water, and took a sip. Then I approached Garrett and threw the water at his face. He grimaced from the shock as well as the impact while I refilled the tumbler. Bloody hell, he said as he wiped his eyes, the water beads drip down, dripping down his face and from the ends of his hair. Are you done? I said. Are you done being an asshole? Because honest to God, I can't take another minute of this. None of us can. One of them is going to walk out for real if you don't cut the crap, Garrett. And when they do, I'm going to follow right behind them. This is how we work, pretty girl. He said, don't like it? Then before he had a chance to finish his sentence, I threw the second serving of water in his face. Mother, stop it. I am not your pretty girl. I am your producer and your colleague. Stop acting like a child and I'll stop treating you like one and show me some goddamn respect. This was what happened when I worked with certain guys. I swore and cursed and got in their face, especially when they condescended or were downright misogynistic to me. After all these years, I was tired of it. This is why it's your last album, I told myself, because you don't need this shit anymore. You never did. Stop taking their side all the time, Garrett screamed. I need someone on my side. I need someone on my side. His face crumpled up and he buried it in his hands and cried. <coughs> it was about Gav. It was always going to be about Gav. I silently chided myself. I should have known. I did know because it was my job to know. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think uh, at this stage, because um, I'm gonna, I've got something I can't wash down, we should take questions. <laughs> um, so I don't have to say anything. But except, except that I will say, again, <laughs> I always hate the question of, well, you know, what's your book about? Because it's easy enough to say this book is about a former pop star turned music producer who's trying to guide a uh, seemingly washed up band back to the glory days. And that is sort of what it's about, but it's not all of what it's about. And uh, it's, there's, there's a whole <coughs> emotional arc that's just, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but I think it's one of your finest books. Thank you. So, questions? Well, I have comments. Yes. When I was here last Friday, I asked about, well, what, what are your books? Or what? Yes. And I think what I got back, I'm not sure if it was Craig or yeah, <laughs> but it was, uh, I think, something like made me think of Harlequin Romance books. Yeah. Oh, I no. never read those. Never. It's, they're no, not. But it made me yeah. think because, yeah. so I think it was that, uh, that genre box of. Yes. You know, and I read books about um, spies and yes. murder mysteries, and that doesn't bother me. There, there's <laughs> always a little bit of crossover because, yes, I do write love stories. And yes, they are primarily, you know, it's a heterosexual love story between man and woman, you know, that type of thing. Um, but my books are not romance. Per se, mm -hmm. there's a, there is a, there is a little bit of crossover, definitely. Right. But you will not see them housed in romance. They're really not. They're and if somebody is putting them in romance, it's because they don't know where else to put them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm glad that's why I came because I, yes. thought, I need to find out about this. What is this really? About? Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad and, you did. <laughs> and, and in almost every case, the love story that parallels the the boy girl love story is the 
is the main character, which is usually a woman, mm -hmm. learning to love herself. Yes. And uh, um, and that's where I think the big emotional sweep. I mean, there's in. a love story between her and her uncle. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, and, yeah. And 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 obviously, I don't mean that in romantic yeah. sense, but there is a deep, deep love right. for her uncle, um, who is also um, passed. Yeah. So. And, and that too is almost always in one of my books. There's there's multiple relationship um, dynamics going on. It's not always just about the romance. It's there's a relationship between mother and daughter. There is a relationship between father and son. There's a relationship between sisters, between best friends. There there's always something else besides just the romance or like you said there's the re there's almost always the relationship with herself I, there's, or himself. The, there's an internal journey yeah for sure yeah i mean paisley slash joey has to get somewhere mm -hmm. you know that she can't get um garrett isn't going to get her there you right. know memories of her uncle is not are not going to get her there um and I, that, that's honestly what i find so compelling because i feel like that's the universal thing. That is, you know, let's forget genre for a minute and let's just talk about stories that move us as human beings. You know? And that's what your review kind of said. Right? Yeah, right. yeah. This goes beyond whatever the genre is, ex is expected to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question, comment, maybe. Um, as some of you know, Elisa and I are friends, mm -hmm. and I've read her books, and I enjoy reading them, Thank and you. I enjoy what you read, and it makes me think if I haven't already asked you at some point, uh, the comment part is that I enjoy the way you write conversations and dialogue. Yes. Oh, God. Yeah. And um, I know you, and I know it's the real deal, because it's... You're, you're not stepping into an alien's shoes to try to figure out how they talk. You're, you're talking as we talk, as they talk, yeah. what's real. And I'm wondering, in figuring out this ca character or the characters involved and the conversations, the banter, um, do you hear it in your head first before you put it on the paper? <laughs> Yes, and here, here's the other fun thing. So, so you also, you guys know I'm a fan of the West Wing and a lot of Aaron Sorkin work. He, I, and I didn't put this together until A, he said, I hear dialogue like music. The, and I thought I had picked that up from him, but then when I was writing my memoir, Friends of Mine, and I wrote the chapter about the fan fiction I wrote when I was 15, 16 years old, and I took that fan fiction out and I, ha I literally had not read it since I was 15, mm. 16. And the first thing I said is, oh my God, the dialogue is great <laughs> for a 15 year old. It was really good. So I, so I suddenly realized I had this all along and I didn't realize it, that I, I had this, this ability. And I think very much that's what it is for me. I never consciously thought about it that way until he said it, but I am definitely hearing um, the dialogue is playing and, and and also when I write, it's very, I'm seeing it too. It's, 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 a, it's an audio visual experience for me. So, which is why I so often when I, when I, even when I wrote my book about writing, I referenced all movies, movies yeah. and television because I see my <clears throat> books like that. I see it almost playing out in front of me. And I, I definitely hear the dialogue. And the way I think about dialogue also is not what is, real per se because any any if you if you do a transcript even of just the two of us talking tonight it's it's messy it's very very messy if you did the literal transcript of the way we just communicated with each other so so the dialogue i am interested in is not literal or real life it's what is authentic to those characters in that world and that's the way I think about it. Um, and I very much play it, I listen to the intonation. 
I listen to the rhythm. I listen to how they are, the pitch, you know, how, how they even say what they say. Um, repetition, you know, um, thing, things like that. So all, all the beats. And so I hear it first and then I write it and then I read it out loud. I was just gonna ask you that yeah. if you read it out loud, maybe record it and to yourself to hear how it scans. I don't record it, okay. but I definitely read it out loud. Or I'll even read it to Craig sometimes. Yeah. And I'll say, What what does this sound like to you? Is it We'll both do that and yeah. we'll you know, we'll go, hold on a second, I gotta make a note because yeah. there'll be something that's discordant and uh, you know, you gotta you gotta notate that you're gonna have to fix it because you'll forget about it if you don't if you don't stop right then. Yeah. Um, if there's nothing else, I think we're gonna let uh, these folks load up with books and uh, goodies we have. Yeah. Well, Cupcakes any are there and, any other yeah, questions yeah. or comments? So, do you start with like bringing your own personal uh, as who you are into your books, starting there, or do you have like the characters are out here and you then bring them in? A little bit of both. <clears throat> um, and, it, and, and, and actually sometimes that even depends on the story. Um, but I have to have empathy for who I'm writing about. And there's always something I'm connecting to. It could be an emotional experience that they're having that I didn't necessarily have. I didn't go through what they went through precisely, but I connect to their, their how they deal with the loss, for example, um, or something like that. In this case, because I grew up with musicians and, and things like that, it was very personal to me. And so I was really, really able to connect to Joey's, she has that same love being in a studio. Of course, she's the professional <laughs> and she's, she's the expert and she, you know, uh, has the impeccable ear. Um, but I know, I know what she's smelling. I know what she's seeing. I know what she's, you know, what's tactile to her in that space. Um, so that's what I brought to her. But obviously I didn't have any of her other experiences in the way she did. But again, this was more subconscious, but what I was kind of going through in my own author career, I think came out in ways I didn't right. set out to do. Um, and especially, I, and by the way, also, I started this book in 2014. <laughs> and it's been a long for, time. for a number of reasons, some professional, some personal, it kept getting pushed to the, to the back burner. I finally, I, I took it, I thought it was going to be a much longer social media break, but it wound up being three three months. But it was a very very productive three months. I took a three month social media hiatus, and that's when I and that was in twenty at the end of twenty twenty, and that's when I picked up this manuscript. And I never ever stopped being in love with it, but it it took on a new dimension that now I had both her maturity and my maturity came together and so I was able to write that. If I can add just a little bit to that because this is something we talk about yes. a lot and in fact and we're I developing I know what you're gonna say. We are developing a, a workshop around this idea. So I have to give credit where credit is due first because Larry Watson who wrote Montana nineteen forty eight and Let Him Go, which is was a Costner movie and he's just written a lot of really fine books. He said this in an interview with Montana Quarterly. He said, I don't write from observation, I write from memory. And then I take the memory and I transform it with imagination into a truth that is, uh, that is useful for fiction. And when I read that quote, I went, man, I'm glad we got writers in the world because I could never put words <laughs> to, to how that works, but it's absolutely the case. And I think in this book in particular, um, but really all of, all of your books and certainly all of mine, there is that little, little kernel of memory that, you, that is your way in. Mm -hmm. and, then you, and then you go to work on it with a hammer and tongs. And at the end, you end up with this thing that is 
not at all what the memory was, but is every bit as true as the memory right. was, even though it's fiction. I mean, it's really, it's, there's a lot of ins and outs to it, but to me, that is, you know, when I'm struggling with the work, it's because I'm not connecting with that. Mm -hmm. And when work is going well, it's because I'm in full connection with that. Right. And so, and I think the same is true yeah. with you. And, you know, when you were not finding the joy, you know, joy was your, your pathway to empathy and everything right. else you needed to feel. feel. And uh, welcome back. Because, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you all so much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you have a question? Well, I do. Yes. Years ago, I remember being at something over at, at the theater. It's on Montana Avenue. Right yeah. Not Art House. But uh. Is it Nova? No. No, no it's, it's the actual theater. Oh, oh, oh. But, um, and I can't even remember the book or anything but it's like uh, um i know that that Alyssa, you're not from montana right and how did you know <laughs> <laughs> well i just <laughs> we don't have a lot of music producers in the <laughs> basement so it's character flows i guess but i'm i am interested in you know you're 15 or 16 year old years old and you're writing fan fiction which i mean i'm Kind of our inarticulate <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of so. This has been you knew you were a writer mm -hmm. when you were 15 or 16, and so and you're here in Billings and you know, list of books. And it, so, how did you nurture that starting when you were 15, 16? What, what that that's a great question. So, how, how did I nurture? this writer in me, I think is what you're asking, from the age of 15. And honestly, the answer was it took another 15 years before I really did. I, A, I didn't show anybody that fan fiction. I still, he's never seen it and he's never gonna see it. Um, he doesn't even, <laughs> he doesn't even know where it is. <laughs> does not know where it is. No, no, and if I find my the house ransacked, man, you're in trouble. Um, and you're cleaning it up. Um, so um, I didn't show it to anybody. I and then at some point, I don't think I even considered myself a fiction writer. I, I wasn't good at short stories, even though I was writing this fan fiction, these little stories, but I didn't consider myself a short story writer. In high school, even though of course I got all the good grades in English, um, the guidance counselors really, and the teachers were not guiding me toward writing. They were saying, they were kind of saying, the only thing they were saying is, well, you could go into journalism. And that was really all they were saying. And that was the one writing I did not want to do. I knew that for sure. I did not want to be a journalist. I did not want to, I wasn't suited for that. He is, but I am not. So, so it, it wasn't until I went to, I, I actually went, I, I had a failed attempt at college and then I went back to college in my mid to late twenties. And it was towards the end of that that I started taking some electives and I started really doing some creative writing again. And those teachers, the professor, one, one in particular said, I think you should take our graduate program. And the graduate program was, was still not creative. It was still not fiction writing. It was writing and rhetoric. And then just as I was going into that program, I had this idea for a novel and that novel eventually became faking it. And even that I did not write until the very end of my grad school career. And I figured nobody was ever going to read that. So I put every, I just threw it all in there, but it was good. And I was surprised that it was good. <laughs> and then, so now I'm 35, 36 years old. I relocate again. I, I'm in North Carolina now. I'm teaching at, at, North, uh, at NC State. I'm in this very, very academic, um, English department 
And the first person I met there turned out to be a novelist. And I said, I showed again what was ultimately going to be faking it. And I said, tell me what to do with this because I have fallen in love with this. I didn't even know this was all in me. Yeah. And that's what started it. So it took all that time. And also one other little thing, in the middle of my doing all my scholarly work on rhetoric and professional writing and, and what was known as first year writing, which is teaching college freshmen how to, you know, students how to write. My twin brother um, gave me Stephen King's On Writing for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I was ready to write Faking It, I had that book in the back of my head. <laughs> and so it all started to come together. But yeah, it took, it took all that time of being away from it. And then when I finally said, when, because that novel wouldn't leave me alone until I wrote it, was, oh, I'm a novelist. <laughs> and that's when I started nurturing it. And even then, it took another four years. It was 40 when I got famous. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. That's a very long answer to a very short question. Uh, yes. One more question. Yes, please. You have um, a number of books come in series. Yeah. And is there another book that someone would need to read before that one? No, no, this is a standalone. All of you, whoops, again. Right. all of you is a standalone. All right. So, <laughs> so, and actually the only series I have is the Faking It series. Um, although I've got an idea for another one and, and <laughs> oh, God help us. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this, so this one is a standalone. Um, what, what I would say that would pair well with it is the memoir about my life as a Duran Duran fan because you see growing up in that musical family and how that influenced my fandom and then how my fandom and then in turn, you know, each one started playing off of each other and things like that, so. Yeah, yeah, and there's surprisingly little like Oh, John, you heartthrob in, <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in the memoir, which, you know, good job. Yeah. <laughs> Staying away from that. Yeah. Yes, Bob. So what genre did they put that one in? Well, I, I, I am independently publishing this. Oh. And, but what I will say, still, actually, I'm that's still, that's still a relevant yeah. question because I did shop it to publishers before I self-published it. Oh. So I asked my literary agent that, who was doing the shopping for me. Um, and I said, what, what is this? What, what are you going to, to pitch this as? And she said, women's fiction. Yeah. And she didn't blink an eye. <laughs> she said, it's women's fiction. And I, and I'm, and I had the same look. I went, really? <laughs> you are? Or this? Oh, yeah, no, 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 this one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, the, and the simple truth of the matter is, is that, that if I had written that book, it would have just been general fiction. Yeah. No, I meant the memoirs. Oh, the, oh, me the memoir, memoir is memoir. memoir. The, mem the genre is memoir. Yeah. Oh. Okay. It, it, you might find a subcategory like music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. I so does that like biography, autobiography, or yeah. memoir? Uh, a memoir would be autobiography, probably. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Depending the, on the a memoir, story. I always define memoir as it, it's an autobiography seen through a particular lens. Uh, yeah. So even though I am starting with my life from birth, I'm looking at it all through that lens of Generation X, Duran Duran fan, right. even in the years before I even discovered the band. Yeah. You know, so that's, gotcha. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about this, no, about was, the memoir. Yeah, no, the memoir is, see, you, yeah. you were on it. Yeah. Um, the memoir is just memoir. Yeah. Uh, but there are definitely some subcategories that I can market that under. Well, thank you all so thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, This House of Books. Yeah. Thank you for our recording favorite, this. Our favorite book <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Mark, for recording. Thank you for the introduction to the introduction. <laughs>
This has been a production of This House of Books.